Good evening. How is the volume? Too high, too low? Good. Okay, just making sure. I'm Angela Mettler. I'm an administrative assistant in the president's office at South Dakota Mines, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Steam Cafe for August of 2021. Uh, and to those of you who are attending online also, welcome. Uh, we've been doing Steam Cafe since April of 2018. It's a partnership with South Dakota Public Broadcasting and Hay Camp Brewing. Couldn't do it without them, couldn't do it without you, so we're glad you're here. Um, I won't take up too much time. I will hand it over to Kayla Pritchard for today. <clears throat> Is that, that volume okay? Feels loud to me, but it's reverberating back at me. Um, I'm Kayla Pritchard, an Associate Professor of Sociology at the School of Mines. Uh, this is the first time I've been in front of a room of people for a year and a half, and it feels weird. Um, I lived in my office last year, taught online, and, you know, it's odd being out of the house and, like, not wearing pajamas. Um, so if... You'll have to bear with me. Again, I'm, I have to get back in the groove of being in front of people, talking, although classes start next week, so that'll, this will be a, a good prelim to that. Um, my talk tonight's titled The Oldest Profession, Sex Work Through the Lenses of History, Feminism, and Sociology. Um, I'm a sociologist, and we, we could do a, an interactive, like, who wants to give me a definition? No, it's okay. Louis? <laughs> I have one of my students sitting up here, right? Uh, sociology is shorthand I tell my students is the individual within context. So um, thinking about the systems and the structures and the environment around the individual and how that influences the choices we make, uh, the behaviors or the, the opportunities we have in front of us and our behaviors in various and across situations. Um, and so I'm going to apply my discipline lens to sex work while also touching on history, which I believe I, you can't teach sociology without also teaching history because you have to understand what has been to know what is. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a feminist lens within this as well. The goal of my talk is not to answer any questions. I'm not going to reveal any uh, long held secrets of anything or define or give definitive answers, but more to um, engage in critical thinking. Um, some, something that I hope is very, is interesting to you. I certainly find sex work interesting and fascinating to study um, as well as just provide some, some offshoots for discussion. Um, hopefully after the talk or at any point in time, you know, stop me on campus or, or send me an email. So to get started, the oldest profession, prostitution is often called the oldest profession. Um, and this actually isn't that old of a phrase. Um, it originated from a Rudyard Kipling story from 1888, where he starts, the moon is a member of the most ancient profession in the world. Uh, and so that's where that phrase comes from. Um, we think of prostitution as the oldest profession, as in it, it originated when civilization originated. Um, but that's actually really not the case. If you really want to talk about the oldest profession, it's tool making. We're making tools for 2.6 million years um, based on archaeological evidence. So I, I don't know if there's any, there's no evidence that I've ever read anywhere that says prostitution dates back 2.6 million years. So it's not actually the oldest, um, although it has been around a very long time. The oldest historical evidence for prostitution dates back uh, to 2400 BCE in Mesopotamia, in Sumar. Um, although there's a lot of famous examples of prostitution throughout history and sex work more broadly, um, this picture of uh, one of the brothels in Pompeii that was excavated. Um, Pompeii had about 25 brothels. Uh, and it was, if you're familiar with the history of, of Pompeii and Roman civilization, they were not shy about sex. Um, in, in, it very contrasted to American society, uh, that it was not a big thing to, to go to a brothel or visit a brothel or, or purchase sex from a woman or a man um, at the time. So in short, prostitution's very old. It's nothing new. It's not always been around, but it's been around for thousands of years. Definitions to kind of guide um, the rest of my talk. Prostitution is simply exchanging sexual activity for something of value. So that could be money, that could be dinner, that could be rent, that could be 
a designer handbag. I mean, whatever that thing of value is, exchanging some sort of sexual services for that thing. Uh, sex work is a much broader definition coined by Carol Lee in the 80s to refer to uh, engaging in sex to generate income. But sex work um, now is a much broader umbrella term to refer to all sorts of uh, occupations that generate income that are sex related or sex adjacent. So even things, um, cam girls, if you're familiar with that, it's, it's basically just uh, stripping on through Zoom or some other, you know, uh, social uh, internet broadcasting and engaging in, in sexual activities there. Um, sugar babies, which are like, uh, we usually it's young girls and older men and men support them financially in exchange for, you know, on once and maybe just company and dinner, conversation over dinner, all the way up to and including uh, sex over a long period of time. Um, street walking, brothels, escorts, phone sex, exotic Xander strippers. So all of these things fall under the umbrella of sex work along with prostitution. So prostitution is sex work. Not all sex work is prostitution. Um, and so I'll use these terms kind of interchangeably throughout the, the talk, but you know, there, there is a, a difference. Um, prostitution is separate though from sex trafficking. Uh, people who are sex trafficked do not have a choice in engaging in that activity. Um, and I'm gonna come back to the idea of choice because it gets a little murkier than that, but basically uh, sex trafficking is sex through force, fraud, and or coercion. So these individuals um, are there entirely against their will and forced to perform um, various sex acts. Um, and they would leave if they could, they would stop doing that if they could, um, but they're usually um, coerced uh, enticed, def um, defrauded, lied to, and then trapped in that situation financially or through threats against themselves or their families. So prostitution is not sex trafficking. Those are different things uh, based on the level of force and coercion and, and, and threats of violence and harm involved in it. So that's an important distinction. All right. Prostitution is a global thing. It's This probably is no surprise. It's not uh, located to one country, one region, one continent. It happens all around the world. Um, this is, is a map based on data from the, let's see, the Shells Foundation in 2021, which is a French nonprofit um, organization that tracks sex work, sex trafficking globally. So it's European. So instead of decimals, there's commas. Um, so you can see that in the United States, we are not among the, I guess that red is hard to see. So I'll look at my map. Does this have a, oh, it has a pointer. Okay, so the US is this color of red, 2.5 to 2.3 individuals um, per 1,000 population engaged in sex work. Uh, the darker red is in this area of the world, China, Mongolia, Mexico, uh, is that Bolivia? South American geography? Um, not my not my strong suit. So there are countries that have higher levels of prostitution, sex work, and the countries lower levels of prostitution and sex work um, relative to the United States. And I'm going to come back to some of these uh, differences in the legal status here in just a minute. Um, some quick statistics on prostitution of uh, roughly 40 to 42 million prostitutes globally, about 8 million of them are men. So the rest being women. Um, one to two million in the United States, there isn't like a registry of, of sex workers or prostitutes in the United States. So these are estimates. Um, and so that's why there's, you know, a million people difference in our estimates. We really don't know if, if you know, there's a woman at home on her computer um, performing sex acts for an internet audience, she's not necessarily going to show up on any list or registry anywhere. So this is an entire guess based on, um, uh, samples. 75% of prostitutes globally are between 13 and 25 years old. Um, and this gets into child prostitution, which is uh, illegal in this country. I uh, consent, I do consent, and most states varies, but it's definitely not 13. Um, and I'm not going to talk about child prostitution tonight. Child prostitution falls into sex trafficking. Um, and that's not the focus of my talk. So when I'm talking about prostitution, I am talking about adults 18 and above. Um, but I thought that was an important statistic to include. 90% of prostitutes globally rely on a pimp. Um, so that means an intermediary. Um, if you think about in terms of market forces, supply, 
the prostitute demand the client, the pimp is the distributor. So someone who maybe sets up dates, uh, controls their finances, um, et cetera. Uh, women often enter prostitution mainly as a last resort, then they didn't have any other feasible options to make money. Um, they might be engaged in prostitution due to a drug addiction to earn money to support that, or as a result of coercion, um, which is different than sex trafficking. But uh, for example, if uh, you know a boyfriend or a husband or an um, other partner might goad them into it's not that bad, just this once, and then you know it's kind of spirals into. Um, full-blown prostitution. Um, compared to a member of the general public, prostitution is very, very dangerous. Murder rates 60 to 100 times higher. Uh, so it's, it's a very dangerous occupation, very dangerous um, activity to be engaged in because I'll get, I'm going to come back to that because of, because of lots of reasons. Um, and then 60 to 70% of prostitutes discuss experiencing physical violence as children. So the backgrounds of many of these women and men are not happy, stable homes. Um, they've experienced trauma. They've experienced um, poverty. They've experienced abuse, which falls uh, goes along with why they saw prostitution or prostitution was the, the best choice financially for them. All right. In the United States, students, when I teach you in sexuality, they always want to talk about Nevada. They want to talk about Vegas. They want to talk about prostitution in Vegas. And I have to say, there is no legal prostitution in Vegas. There's prostitution in Vegas, but it's illegal. Um, Nevada is the only state with legalized prostitution in brothels, but only in some counties. Um, this map is from the LA Times from May 6th of 2018. Uh, majority of the brothels are in rural parts of the state. Um, state law prohibits brothels in counties with over 400,000 population, which really only applies to Clark County, which is where Las Vegas is. So that's the only county where it's uh, illegal to have brothels other than the other six that have county ordinances outlawing brothels. Um, and the rest of the counties might have the ability to have a brothel under the law, but they don't um, in practical terms. So Carson City, this little bit right there um, where the state capital is, bans brothels, for example, um, Washoe County, where Reno is, the tall skinny one there also bans brothels, even though they, they could under the state law have them. Um, in Nevada, in the counties that do run and operate brothels, the women are independent contractors. They negotiate contracts with management. They can negotiate their shifts, um, how long they're going to be working in a day, how long for a period of time, one month, two months, six months, etc. They can live in the brothels for a fee. They can live off site and go to work like all of us do. Um, presumably, we don't I don't live in my office um, most days. License, uh, the prostitutes in these brothels have to be licensed. They have to be registered with the county. They pay for and undergo um, mandatory health checks um, regularly, including weekly pap smears, monthly blood tests for sexually transmitted infections. Condoms are mandatory in Nevada brothels. Um, the, the prostitutes in these brothels in Nevada compared to uh, illegal brothels report less violence. They report feeling safer at work. There's big security guards um, that if any man gets out of hand, gets rowdy, gets violent, uh, he's promptly escorted off the premises. Um, the women pay taxes. They pay work card fees. They pay house fees if they live on site. They pay room and board fees. Um, they keep about 40 to 50% of what they earn, uh, which doesn't feel like a lot. Um, when I keep 100% of what I earn from my job, but they have all these other mandatory expenses that allow them to do this work in the first place. Overall, the Nevada brothel industry are about 35 to $50 million a year and serve about 400 clients annually. So it's big business in those counties. Um, although even the counties that have brothels, there's, they're still in contention over whether they like them, want to keep them. Is this good? Is this what we want? Is this not? Um, there's regular legal battles over uh, trying to outlaw the brothels in the counties in, where, in which it's legal. What do we do with prostitution? So for a long time in the United States um, and similar nations, prostitution is viewed as a problem that it is undesirable, this is something that we don't want. So there's various legal methods to handle, control, regulate, try to eliminate prostitution. Kind of start out one extreme and go to the other. So there's lots of countries in the world that just outright ban prostitution. Um, and the countries that I've given here are not an exhaustive 
list, but just a sampling of, of to give you an, an idea of which countries uh, fall under which legal criteria. So South Africa, the United States, other than those few counties in Nevada, uh, China, Russia, all ban. Um, prostitution is illegal in all forms. Something being illegal does not mean it doesn't exist, but there are severe consequences um, depending on the country for being caught um, engaging in prostitution or prostitution related activities. There's the Nordic model um, named so because in 1999, Sweden passed a law criminalizing the purchase of sex, but not the sale of sex. So the, the intent of the law was that um, to deter men from buying sex from women and to punish them for doing so. So they tackled the demand. So if we can lessen the demand for sex, there will be less of a supply of people offering sex, um, which makes sense in theory. It didn't work like that. I mean, it hasn't worked out like that um, since they passed the Sex Purchase Act in 1999. Um, there's been less street walking, less women on the street soliciting uh, potential clients, and it's just moved sex and the sex trade indoors on the internet, in brothels, um, and other indoor places kind of away from the eyes of um, law enforcement that might be driving around the street. Norway enacted this law, same law in 2009, as have France and Canada um, in the last 20 years. Norway claims that this law has reduced human trafficking completely in their country um, because it makes Norway less attractive for sex-based and prostitution-based activities. Uh, in Oslo, for example, convicted sex buyers face a 25,000 crown fine, about 4,000 US dollars. So it's a pretty steep fine um, in Oslo for being caught purchasing sex. Um, however, opponents to these laws say that um, it makes women rely on more dangerous customers because if the more mild-mannered clients are going to be dissuaded from purchasing sex, then that leaves only men who might be a little more aggressive, a little more violent. Um, it also drives the price down. So women actually have to turn more tricks. They have to service more clients in order to make the same amount of money as they would have previously. Um, and it also, opponents argue, increases the risk to them because since all of the burden is on the purchaser for illegally, men may not want to give their real names. Um, so prostitutes can check them out beforehand. So if you're making a date over the internet, a prostitute might do a little Googling, try to figure out who this guy is, is he safe? Um, they may, men might not want to give their real name. Uh, so women can't do that. And it also, um, but sex workers do have the backing of the law on their side, um, that they're not going to get legally in trouble. It would be the purchaser of their services. So there, it's, every, all of these are a mixed bag. Um, there's partial bans that look a little different and that have mixed results depending on where it is. So in countries like Finland, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and England, it's illegal to buy sex from someone forced to sell sex. So again, sex trafficking then is illegal, which like, okay, that makes sense. Sounds great. Um, other than that, it's various degrees of legal and illegal depending on the locality and the nation and all of that. Um, soliciting in public, pimps and brothels are illegal in places like Scotland, India, and Brazil. So the other forms of prostitution are theoretically then legal under the law. So it's kind of a mixed bag in some of those countries. Uh, decriminalization is a, a that getting caught for selling sex or buying sex has no criminal penalty under the law. Um, so it's different than legalization, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, decriminalization is supported by many sex worker rights campaigns, but also by Amnesty International and the World Health Organization. It allows sex workers to take control of their services um, and eliminate or helps reduce exploitation of them by others because they have no criminal penalty under the law of going to the police and reporting uh, a violent client or other abuses. New Zealand, um, the only two parts of the world that have decriminalized prostitution are New Zealand, which claims they have completely eliminated all sex trafficking. Um, and then New South Wales in Australia, that one state in Australia has decriminalized sex work. Um, all the other states have, have varying laws. Uh, critics of this approach say it doesn't solve larger issues like child exploitation um, or sexual exploitation. It doesn't address social or gender inequality, and it doesn't eliminate the stigma associated with sex work. And then the other extreme to um, a ban is legalization. 
And this is, does not exist in um, large parts of the world, but more than, than one would guess, I would think. Um, so places like Turkey, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Germany, Hungary, Greece, and, and many other countries um, have fully legalized prostitution. Um, prostitution, much like in, in the counties in Nevada, have are independent workers. They register with the state. They obtain a permit. They pay taxes. There's regular health checks um, for them. The goal and the purpose of legalizing it is to get it out of the shadows, bring it up above ground, um, protect women and their rights in these countries to sell their sexual services. Um, Proponents argue it reduces the links of organized crime with prostitution, and it provides more safety to those, those workers selling sexual services. Um, at the same time, it creates a second tier of prostitution. So those people who do not want to register with the government, um, it drives them into a lower tier that is more dangerous, um, both by clients and as well as uh, sexually transmitted infections, and makes that work much more dangerous for them. So there's no easy solution to what to do with prostitution, although what you want to do with prostitution depends on how you think about prostitution in general and prostitutes specifically. Um, other places within the United States have gotten a little more creative with trying to dissuade prostitution. So, you know, clients that have been caught purchasing sex, putting their face on a billboard or putting a, a sign in their yard, um, outing them as, as trying to purchase sex. Um, some localities have instituted what they call John schools. So if a man gets caught purchasing sex, he gets sent to John school where they basically try to teach him, show him um, why he shouldn't purchase sex, the um, danger to many prostitutes, uh, you know, why these women are, are doing this work in the first place to try to dissuade him from doing it in the future. These programs have varying levels of effectiveness, but it largely depends on the program and the individual uh, being subjected to it. All of these solutions are individual level. Um, they target the people selling sex, they target people buying sex, um, either in and then criminalize them or regulate it, you know, on either extreme. I'm gonna come back to this idea of focusing on the individual in a minute. Um, but I'm going to focus, shift right now to the cultural and social views of prostitution and sex work. So I've been using she as the seller of sex and he as the purchaser of sex. Um, and that's not an accident. You know, most prostitutes, most sex workers globally are women. Most purchasers of sex or sexual services are men. Um, and that makes prostitution, specifically in sex work more broadly, a gendered experience that we can't understand it without understanding the, you know, using the lens of gender to explain why people engage in these behaviors. Culturally, in the United States, we have a lot of mean words for women who sell sex or women who are viewed to be too promiscuous or too, too easy um, sexually. So just, you know, whore, harlot, slut, tart. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, there aren't many equivalents for men. I ask students this every, you know, every some, so on to get them to generate a list, and they just can't because they don't exist. I mean, man whore doesn't have the same cultural weight as calling someone a slut. It, it just doesn't have the same social consequences. Um, and, and men who sell sex, the male prostitute, the male ass escort have to have that qualifier male because by default, a prostitute is a woman, but a male prostitute, you have to have that extra adjective to denote whom you're talking about. Um, and so, you know, even the, the man whore is, you know, mocked, um, derided, and uh, male prostitutes are often ignored. Um, they're kind of this, this secondary tier of prostitution in the American imagination that we know exists, but it's such a small number and they're kind of a joke anyway, um, even though there's a, a wide berth of work on men who sell sex, um, mostly to other men, but also to women. Um, not the focus tonight, but it's out there, it exists, and it's really interesting. Put up here, Maddie Silks. Um, and I didn't talk on the very, that my title slide, I had a picture of the sign of the Deadwood Brothel Museum in Deadwood, South Dakota. There's brothel legal there for over 120 years, only ending in 1980 when the FBI raided it. If you've not been through the brothel museum, go. It's fascinating, it's interesting, um, and it's right in our, our own backyard, so to speak. Um, Maddie Silks is one of those uh, madams at the height of brothels in the Old West. She was a madam in Denver, Colorado, very formidable. Um, just as a quick aside, uh, she had custom-made gowns that always had two pockets, one for her gold and one for her gun. 
Um, and she was the undisputed queen of Denver's red light district up until her death in 1929. Um, and just a quick description of, of her girls, because I think it, it's just so poetic. Um, and this is from the book uh, Hell's Bells by Clark Seacrest, that her girls were known to possess the prettiest of faces, the tiniest of waist, the creamiest of bosoms, the daintiest of giggles, the best of conversational skills, the most imaginative techniques, the perkiest of personalities, and the best of acting abilities, leading the customer to believe that she really cared. Right, this is top-notch prostitution in, in the Old West in Denver, but um, further kind of illustrating the, the complexities of, of prostitution um, because they have allowed, and I'll, I'll come back to this a little more in a minute, women to be financially successful, financially independent, wealthy in a time where opportunities, employment opportunities for women were, were sparse and uh, didn't pay very well. Views on prostitution are guided by Victorian ideals. So Victorian era, you know, roughly most of the 1800s, um, Queen Victoria, England, she died in 1901. And our modern day views of prostitution stem from these ideas from the Victorians, you know, well over 100, 150 years ago. Um, since the Victorians, we viewed prostitutes as they're criminals, they're breaking the law, they are more importantly immoral, they are indecent, they are licentious, right? They are harlots. They you know, wantonly and willfully give their bodies to any man with a coin in his pocket. Um, and, and they're therefore an immediate threat to the social fabric, to family and to marriage and love. Um, Victorians viewed prostitutes as the, the complete opposite of what a good woman should be. And this view is still with us. Um, we might have a little more sympathy today and recognize, you know, the prostitute as, as the, you know, product of bad choices, unfortunate circumstances, a bad family life, you know, a bad hand in life. But prostitutes as a broad category of, of workers are highly stigmatized, heavily stereotyped. Um, this is why the term sex worker is preferable to some people because the prostitute has such heavy connotation or sex worker um, by some arguments might give them a little more humanity identify that sex work is work, um, which is a common refrain among sex worker advocates, that sex work is work, it is labor, in the same way that other jobs are labor, require um, physical presence, require emotional labor, the monitoring of, of feelings and emotions um, in order to earn an income. Um, more broadly, sex workers and prostitutes have been, there's documentation of them being discriminated against in terms of housing, in terms of access to goods and services, in terms of employment, in terms of access to justice when they have been harmed. Um, specifically, they've, there's reports of, of sex workers having their Airbnb accounts suspended, their PayPal accounts closed, and being bad from various forms, forms of advertising. Um, and if, you know, if I'm a self-employed sex worker and you take away my ability to advertise my services, you don't leave me with many other options um, that might lead to more dangerous conditions, uh, reduce my ability to check out my dates or my clients before engaging with them. Um, and it makes the work more dangerous overall. Which then add in the feminist lens now. So I know that's like the other F word, the other bad word that everybody misunderstands. Um, what feminism is, because we have this culturally constructed image of, you know, the hairy, angry woman burning her bra in a trash can, uh, which never happened. No, that never happened, actually. They threw bras in the trash can at that Miss America pageant in 1967. They did not burn them, although I would understand if they did. Um, feminism is basically the perspective that women in early waves and now LGBTQ individuals as well as men um, should have the same political, economic and personal rights. It's basically it. There's lots of different flavors of feminism. There's, you know, like you can, you know, you go to the store and look at the flavors of ice cream. There's that many kinds of feminisms and you put different kinds of feminists in a room, they will tear each other apart. Um, the diametric, diametrically opposed philosophy. So feminism is a broad movement, but that's basically the gist of it is people should have the same access to political, economic, and personal rights. Um, because I can, because it's fun, a quick history of feminism, just, just four waves, uh, first wave, suffrage, right to vote, ended in 1920, 19th Amendment. We're coming up on the anniversary. I think it's on August 26th 
of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Um, second wave feminism um, mostly will focus on rights in the workplace. So ending um, sexual harassment in the workplace, increasing women's access to educational opportunities, to you know, reducing pregnancy discrimination, reducing uh, or eliminating you know, the, the fact that I could be fired if I got married or fired if I got pregnant um, from my job. But of course, people worked on a variety of issues. Second wave feminism is roughly, you know, 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, you know, the women's movement and all that third wave, 80s, 90s ish. There's no hard lines in all of this, mostly focusing on identity work, um, sexuality, intersectionality. So how our different identities uh, intersect, overlap with one another and how that influences our experience. And now the fourth wave is identified as queer sex positive, trans inclusive, body positive, and, and digitally driven, which seems to be the key defining point of fourth wave feminism, is it, it uses the internet and social media to um, engage in discussion and outreach. So that was feminism 101 real quick. Going back to prostitution, there's two main kind of feminist camps when it comes to prostitution. Then on one hand, prostitution is empowering, that when chosen gives women agency, give them power, give them control over their bodies, control over their sexuality, and this is a good thing. The other camp says that prostitution by default is exploitative, that choice is actually irrelevant because um, it, re it represents the exploitation of women by men for sexual pleasure of men. Again, lots of different feminisms. You put two, you know, person who's in each of these camps in the same room, they will not, they don't like each other. I don't know if feminists are the same. So in more detail, and I referenced um, the worker, you know, sex work is work. Uh, the sign from the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, which is a Australian festival every year um, engaged or with a focus on kind of critical thinking on a wide variety of social issues. Um, this perspective says that women should be free to choose to sell sex. So those countries that legalize prostitution would fall into this camp, that this is a personal choice, this is an individual freedom. If I have a service that people are willing to pay me for, I should have the right to sell that service at whatever price I can command. Um, it's basic market forces. If there's a demand and I have the supply, I should be able to sell. Um, people in this camp argue that Prostitution gives women bodily control. It gives them autonomy. Like I said before, control over their bodies, control over their sexuality. Um, I, I alluded to this with Maddie Silks. Historically, sex work, sex work has offered women the opportunity for ind independence as madams, but also as single women, as proprietors of their own um, independent business that they might operate from their room, from their house that they rent uh, and allow them the freedom uh, that would be otherwise denied to them um, in employment as secretaries or uh, teachers, right? So it has allowed women to make uh, good money at times when financial options were not abundant. Um, there's one argument that says, well, prostitutes are actually exploiting the men that buy from them because, again, if you're willing to pay me money for things I have, then you're the sucker, not me. And so that's, there's that argument too, rather than men exploiting women. Um, the empowerment perspective sees prostitution as just another form of employment. This is just another job that any you know, entrepreneur could engage in if there's demand for their goods and services. Um, and then that then spawns movements to support sex workers, advocate for rights for sex workers, um, advocate for safety, for sex workers um, to not be subjected to the risk of violence, the threat of violence by their clients. So the other camp though, that prostitution is inherently exploitative, um, questions the idea of what, what does it mean to choose prostitution? So if, I, if I'm choosing prostitution, then that means I reject the other options available to me. Well, what other options are available to me? If my options are being a server at a restaurant for you know, $2.80 an hour plus tips or selling my sexual services where I can make 10 times that, 20 times that, is that really a choice? I certainly, you know, if no one's forcing me 
under you know sex trafficking to engage in prostitution. That's that's irrelevant right and now. But how much of a choice is there if my choice is minimum wage work or prostitution, where I can make a lot more money a lot faster and have a then a better quality of life as a result of my greater income? The prostitute's interests are wholly opposite that of her client and that of, of a pimp um, if he is involved as well. And they're almost always a he in that transaction. So her interests are not the same as the purchaser of her services as well as the person distributing her services. Um, so what if women had other choices, like really other choices? Um, for decades, a lot of feminists have argued that prostitution is caused by consumers that if there wasn't demand, you wouldn't have the sale of sex, which is why those countries targeting the demand aspect of it um, having have instituted those laws, trying to reduce demand to then reduce the supply, although that hasn't really worked out like that in reality. But commodifying sex and sex acts erases the humanity of the person selling it. It turns them into a thing. Um, it, it, it's easy not to see them as a person with ideas and hopes and dreams and you know wants and fears and just turns them into a body, turns into a thing to be used, paid, and then discarded and moved on. Um, not that all men purchasing sex are you know callous robots, but if you're just talking to someone to engage in a, a, you know, a simple transaction, it's easy to view them as not wholly a person in the same way we might view a friend or a loved one. Um, so the people in this exploitation camp argue that if women are primarily prostitutes and men are the primarily consumers of sex, that this reproduces gender inequality on a structural scale. It's not one man and one woman, but if these two categories of people fall into these different gender categories, what does that say then about gender equality or the choices that people have as a whole? And it reinforces the stereotypes that we hold about sex workers as well as the people who buy sex from them, um, which are also not treated very well under our cultural imagination. On the extreme side of this uh, perspective, there's feminists who argue that even marriage is exploitative um, under the traditional framework that if a woman uh, marries a man and basically sells uh, her housekeeping and sexual services for financial and economic support, um, that that's exploitative. Um, I don't take that view, but it's an argument out there. And again, as I said, I'm not here to give answers, but some food for thought and discussion. However, this argument um, in, in kind of the daily lives of sex workers, it really becomes a moot point. Um, for most of the women in prostitution, sex work is not an abstract symbol of empowerment or an exercise of intersectional feminism. It's something they need to do to survive or to support their families. That if you're looking at the choice of whether or not to engage in sex work, these kind of theoretical academic arguments are really irrelevant. Um, if it's, it's the choice of eating or not, or a roof or not. So then what's missing is sociology. In, in all things, all the time, what's missing is sociology. So um, I said at the beginning that sociology is the individual within context. So much of American culture focuses on the individual, what we do or don't do that then results in the thing happening or not happening to us that then is our fault or our success based on what we did as individuals. So in prostitution, there's this cultural lore, you know, you can get on and watch what 65% of lifetime movies. And it's what that woman did or didn't do that got her into prostitution or got her out of prostitution. She, she pulled herself out through grit and hard work. Um, I'm all for recognizing that sex work is work and you know it, it's labor and it's you know physical labor, it's emotional labor um, and those things should be recognized. But if we focus too much on the individual, we're missing the context. If we focus on just these, you know, sex work is empowering or sex work is exploitative, you're missing the context um, around it. What if we shifted our focus to systems instead of individuals? And that's what sociology challenges uh, people to do is think about the context, the context around individuals, the context around their choices and the opportunities presented to them. So specifically thinking through the consequences of criminalization, if we arrest a sex worker and now she has a criminal record, it makes it that much harder for her to get out of prostitution. If we arrest a sex worker because she is selling sexual services to support a drug addiction, we're not helping the drug addiction. We're adding more burden to her to get out from all under the drug addiction as well as sex work. Um, so thinking about the causes of prostitution, if we, if we don't think about the causes as in she chose to do that and the causes of what systems 
failed her, what systems are, are lacking that give her real choice and whether or not to keep engaging in prostitution or to start engaging or to stop, what would that look like if we shifted our focus? So sociological solutions focus much more on the public policy side than on what her as an individual should or should not do. Um, so public policy has looked at right eliminating the demand. So if we if we tackle the clients and we criminalize them, or if we criminalize the, the person selling the sex, or we shut down all the brothels, or we increase police patrols in neighborhoods known um, for a lot of solicitation, that's all still focused on the individual. If you arrest one individual, you arrest one client, there are still thousands, millions out there. Um, so what would happen if we looked at a much broader solution um, to address prostitution directly, but also a lot of other things more broadly? If we're interested in reducing prostitution, if we're interested in eliminating prostitution, what are we really talking about? Um, are we talking about the, you know, the perceived uh, lack of intimacy that should be in sexual activity between two people? Well, you can't really control that by any means. There's plenty of married people who lack you know, intimacy in, in, in their sexual lives. So what are we, are we, what are we talking about? When we really don't like or want to eliminate prostitution. When you talk about supply and demand, market forces, you know, economics 101, that doesn't really work. You can't regulate that when it comes to sex work. Um, like I said, arresting an individual only takes them out of the market for a short period of time. Um, if we help an individual, that's only helping that individual, what about all the others? So as a sociologist, I'm looking and more interested at structural changes, systemic changes. Not that helping individuals is bad. We should definitely keep doing that. Um, people who want to stop engaging in prostitution or avoid it in the first place, we should definitely keep doing that. Um, but what if we took that broader approach? Complex problems require complex solutions. If a woman is engaging in prostitution as a last resort to make ends meet, then the issue is not prostitution, but poverty. So what if we addressed poverty? What if we addressed education? What if we addressed housing? What if we addressed neighborhood violence? What if we addressed family violence? What if we addressed drug use and healthcare and sex education? Not that these things are simple. I'm, I'm not trying to be glib and say, oh, these things are easy, you know, sign some legislation, done. Um, but trying to shift thinking, this is what I try to do in my classes with students, is instead of focusing on the individual and what they did or didn't do, what if we looked at systems? So by addressing any one of these things, you would not only make it easier for people to not choose prostitution, to get out of prostitution, but you would help countless other people in countless other ways and reduce inequalities more broadly. So to wrap up, final thoughts. Questions, right? Um, we'll never be able to eliminate prostitution. It's been around for millennia. There have been countless societies, and even in our current global environment, countless ways to address, deal with, handle, regulate prostitution and their sex work. Should we want, should, we, should this even be a goal? Should we still continue to try to get rid of prostitution? Is there a way to um, live with it, make it safe? And that's where that decriminalization argument comes in, to not punish people and make it harder for them to get out of that line of work, but to provide them opportunities and support. Um, along with systemic change, I would argue, what would true choice look like? Truly free choice. That I'm not going to argue that there's not somebody out there who would willingly sell sex for money. I mean, there are people out there. Um, should we deny them that? Because prohibition in anything really doesn't work. Even those countries that outlaw, ban sex work with severe penalties still have sex work. There are still people selling and buying sexual services. What if we more broadly recognize the complexity of individual circumstances, which is my perspective as a sociologist and what I try to pass on to students. Um, and I have history and biography, which are the terms that uh, C. Wright Mills used in the 50s when, when trying to describe the sociological perspective, that my biography as an individual interacts with my place in history to influence my circumstances, to influence my opportunities, to influence the choices I have in front of me to make. So instead of just looking at the individual and their successes and failures as wholly being on them, which there is a part of that, absolutely, don't get me wrong, but what if we just looked more broadly around them? What, if, what would shifting that perspective actually mean um, for various social ills, social problems, much like prostitution? Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions? There is one that came in online, so I can start with that. Porn's in sex work. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, where does porn fit in? That was the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other talk, right? And all the rules and the laws around regulating the, the pornography industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, maybe not if you're at School of Mines, maybe not on campus, but Pornhub every year releases a report of access to their website. It doesn't actually include any pornography in the report, but you can get, uh, uh, that report includes what types of what genres people are accessing, what time of day, how long they're on the site, the regions of the country and the world that they're in. You can correlate the region to the type and it's fascinating. So if, if, you're, if you're curious, um, Pornhub 2021 report. <laughs> you can Google. Um, I've tried to even share it to like Facebook and Facebook is like, no, you can't. And I'm like, but there's no porn here. Uh, but it, it's really, I mean, that's a whole other. I tell students, um, I, I, some semesters I've, I've shared a classroom with one of my, one of my other history colleagues and he teaches American history right after my class. And so his students are filing in the room and I'll go ask them, ask him about the civil war and, and pornography. And they're like, what? And then sometimes they do. Um, and so the civil war actually jump started the pornography industry because that was a, uh, at the time when the camera was invented and he allies men very far from home and this new technology, boom, pornography industry. Civil War. Who knew? Well, it all comes back to military history. I mean, it does it though, Allison. Thought about Calvinism specifically, but during the American Revolution time period, you know, late 18th century um, into the early 19th century, they had a very a different view about desire and lust than we do um, contemporarily, because our contemporary view is, is very much in line with Victorians, that these women are women sinful and immoral, and you know, they, but they but they need to be saved. We should save them and help and redeem the prostitute. Um, in around the, the 1700s, women were viewed as lustful, right? They were the Jezebel. They are going to tempt good godly men away from, um, you know, morality and purity into this, this den of sin. By the time the Victorians came, it, it juxtaposes their, their ideas about prostitution because they viewed women's sexuality as very much, um, women didn't have any. In, in much of a Victorian era, the women, you know, Queen Victoria is misquoted as telling her first daughter when she get married to, you know, lie still and think of England. Um, and basically that the sex and marriage is a thing you just have to endure. <laughs> because women couldn't possibly enjoy sex in any capacity. So from around the late 1700s to the mid 1800s, the narrative had completely flipped um, regarding about, sorry, women being you know, lustful Jezebels versus pure asexual beings. It's kind of off tangent, but that's what came to mind. Jonica. I have sort of a tangent. I love it. So in the body, you said that Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're like independent contractors, right? So their their wages are, you know, taxed. Uh, those tax dollars go to anything in particular, or just kind of tax? Not that I know of. I, as far as I know, it just goes into the the tax base for that county. Just like you know, someone working at McDonald's would pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's not going away. It's no, no. Um, as a sociologist, I'm always skeptical of claims of nature, human nature, because so much of our views of the world are socialized from a very, from prior to our birth. 
um, through our parents and media and other caregivers. So, but the sex drive, hunger drive, you know, we need to sleep, we need to eat. And most people experience a sex drive, although there's quite a few people who don't um, experience sexual desire in any capacity, or romantic desire, even in any capacity. But there's plenty of people who do. And as long as there is demand, there will be supply. And it's been around about 5,000 years, but you know, that we know of, it's not going anywhere. There's animals. Animals will, um, penguins, I can't remember the species of penguin, but there's a species of penguin. It's a humble, builds the pebble nests. So there, there's evidence that a female humble penguin will have sex with a male penguin and then take his pebbles, like in exchange for his pebbles, like they're their thing of value. It's like animals, you know, we call that that's prostitution or that's, you know, mating behavior, but potato, potato in some ways. I don't know. In this country, I think that's very far off. Um, there's even, you know, a place like the Netherlands that has legalized sex work and a famous red light district in Amsterdam, right? It's still viewed negatively. It's still stigmatized, even though it's much more acceptable than it is in the United States. So not in my lifetime, certainly. But that, that's been the fight, is to recognize sex work as work. These people deserve labor protections, just like anybody else. You know, I should be able to engage in my work without the threat of violence, without the threat of coercion, without being robbed. Um, I, I don't know. Oh my God, I was. And I meant to start my talk with that story. And then again, 18 months of me in my home office. Um, you know, when I went to the brothel museum uh, to, to view it after it had been completed, um, I went in and I told the, the kid at the register, I was like, oh, I'm in the museum. And he's like, ha ha, yeah, right. And I'm like, no, I am. So I was a consultant. Um, if, you, if you go, there's a, a room with a looped video, like many museums have, I'm on the video. And so I'm like, and I'm like, no, really. I'm, I'm on the video. Like, have you not watched it? Look, here I am. And he was, oh no, because a lot of people say that. Like, ha ha, I'm in the brothel museum. And I'm like, one, I want to meet these people. Who, do, who makes that joke? And two, like, no, I really am in the museum. And this is the highlight of my professional career. And it's downhill from there. Um, because, I mean, who can say that? It, it, is, it is an amazing museum cataloging the 120 four years of legal prostitution in Deadwood. Like I said, only ended in 1980, which is not that long ago. My students feel like that's like centuries ago, but that's not that long ago. Um, and, and the people of Deadwood were very unhappy about that. They fought to keep the brothels because those women were an integral part of their communities. They supported, um, you know, nonprofit organizations. They supported kids, you know, selling their candy bars around after school, right? For fundraisers and things. Um, it was just, it was just part of the community, part of the fabric of the community and very in line with the history, the very kind of wild west gold mining shootout Deadwood history. Um, it, it's an amazing museum that just traces kind of the shifts in prostitution over that, that 124 years. I think. So if you get the opportunity, go, go check it out. It, it is. Um, I mean, the FBI raided the last brothel, which kind of ended the whole thing. And I, I think, um, I mean, no one, as far as I know, no one really knows like the reason that, but I think the FBI just got tired of the local authorities looking the other way. Because I mean, it, it, the brothels were operational in Deadwood, but they were illegal, like under federal law, like it's illegal to sell sex. Again, in keeping with the kind of the Wild West theme, um, nobody seemed to mind to, I'm sure there are people who minded. I'm sure there were people who would have rather seen the brothels gone. But like everybody was pro brothel. But and in line with the, the history of empowerment that they allowed women to earn some good money 
for a little while. I mean, that was the only employment when many women came west with the cowboys. What are you gonna do? There's no typist jobs. You can go be a nurse. You, you, there's, you can be a wife or you can work in a brothel. Or the brothel's a means to a wife. I mean, meet a lot of men. So the question that came in online sure. um, is back to the empowerment versus exploitation argument. Um, the, the comment is that that argument seems really tied up with ideas about or elements of capitalism. And the question is, are there other ways of talking about prostitution and sex work that get outside of capitalism? For instance, countries that work on more of a socialism model, do they talk about prostitution differently than we do in America? Um, or are there anarchist approaches that provide a different framework for thinking about sex work and prostitution? I don't, in the United States and, and many Westernized nations, I don't think you can talk about prostitution as outside of capitalism because you're, you're selling and buying. I mean, there's, there's more, you know, supply and demand forces that if I have a thing that people want to buy, whether that's a thing that I made and I'm selling on Etsy, or that's my body, if there's a demand for that and I can make some money, I mean, that, that's a, a basic capitalist um, exchange to that of selling a thing for, for a price. Um, even in countries that have different economic models, that's still the dominant framework. You're still selling a service for a price. Um, the only way to get away from that is to, you know, expand sexual access by all to all under a very much more free love model um, outside of like monogamy and marriage, which in many nations just is inconceivable. Um, one of my favorite stories I like to tell my students is during Victorianism, there was an entire free love movement. We think of the Victorians as these very prudish, you know, sexually restrained individuals. There was a whole movement of people advocating free love, the abolition of the nuclear family, the abolition of marriage, um, basically a communist society, you know, it kind of microcosms of, you know, communities where people just you know, not forcing people to have sex with each other, but hey, if you guys want to have sex, go for it. Um, outside of kind of monogamy and marriage. One of the free lovers uh, was named Victoria Woodhull, and she also ran for president in 1870 um, with Frederick Douglass as her running partner. Women couldn't vote. <laughs> and she was like, I'm going to be president. She was amazing. They called her Mother Satan. They, uh, Victorians, Com Anthony Comstock, who railed against contraception and, and, you know, everything that she stood for just hated her so much. Dan. Oh, of course. Oh, what? Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, morality in this country often comes back to Christian morals of, you know, sex within marriage between, you know, husband and wife. And so, at the same time, if you look at that porn hub data, most of the porn consumption is in the Southeast United States, in the Bible Belt. Um, men will, you know, there's plenty of, of historical evidence and contemporary evidence, men visit a prostitute on Saturday night and go to church Sunday morning. So all, you know, men, and again, I'm using men of all faiths, of all faith backgrounds, uh, not all men, but representative of all faith backgrounds. Um, have visited sex workers. I think the stigma. I mean, you, there's prostitution in the Bible, right? There, there's prostitution is mentioned multiple times um, in, in the Bible, old, both Old and New Testament, um, in various ways of derision, but also of sympathy. And, and I think there's, I'm not super great about quoting the Bible um, as far as my, just my memory of it, but I'm pretty, I know there is a, a line somewhere in there about um, being, it being preferable for a man to visit a prostitute than to masturbate because that's wasted seed versus at least using a person. 
So the Bible's kind of contradictory in, in that regard when it comes to prostitution. Um, I think the stigma around prostitution and of prostitutes has a little bit of that moral high ground that if I can deride you and, and make you an outcast, then it makes me feel a little better. I can, you know, sit on my moral superiority, even if my, you know, I visited a prostitute before, right? So I, I, there's definitely some of that. Anybody else have any other questions? There weren't any more that came in on, online, so. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming. Um, we do this every third Tuesday. Um, so I think September is the 20th or 21st, something like that. Um, and we will be featuring another of our humanities and social sciences professors. Uh, his name is Bryce Tellman, and he's going to be speaking about the um, defining a region is what his talk is called. And he's going to be talking about how the Great Plains has been defined throughout history uh, by its residents and the stories they tell and should be pretty interesting, I think. So hope to see you next month. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone.